Coming up on this episode of South Coast Spotlight, take a tour of art making in action, find out more about our local heroes, and be encouraged to play in the streets. All that and more, right now on South Coast Spotlight. Welcome to South Coast Spotlight. I'm Dominique Samaria with TV Santa Barbara. We're here in the Funk Zone, a hub for arts and culture in Santa Barbara. We visited a new showroom that combines their art pieces with a little bit of history. The Sumerians were the first to develop bronze. Now, over 5,000 years later, their ancient techniques can be witnessed in Santa Barbara's Funk Zone at a metal shop known as the Foundry. But this isn't just a place to buy metal sculptures. We do everything all in-house, so we're very much made in Santa Barbara. That's what differentiates us from a, a regular art gallery. From the first step into the foundry, a theme becomes blatantly apparent. We definitely do focus on the frogs. We've been producing frogman's work in, the, in this area for about 30 years. In the daytimes, while I was doing mason work, I would uh, collect all these earthworms that I'd see as I was digging the ground so that I could tap on the rocks and the frogs would come and I'd feed them these earthworms. All this imagery of these beautiful frogs I would tap into. And the response has been favorable. And most people can't just buy one frog. They start with one frog and then they move on to 10, 20. People find a lot of similarities with themselves and the frogs. I try and capture some tension, a little bit of tension, not on every piece. In addition to sharing these vibrant, glossy amphibians, the Foundry hopes to enlighten visitors about the ancient process that brings them to life. To do this, they offer public viewings and tours of its very own bronze-making facilities. We have a silicone rubber mold that can have wax actually injected into it. And then once that has time to cool, then we have a wax replica of the original art. The next step in this time-intensive process is the slurry and dip. And that's where we're building a ceramic shell around the wax original. Then we melt out the wax using a steam autoclave. Not a lot of people understand that a, that a frog that can fit inside the palm of your hand takes 100 hours, all done by hand. It's a very labor-intensive process. Then it's time for Frogman's masterpieces to really shine in the patina process. But this step is a little temperamental. The metal itself needs to be heated to the perfect temperature. If it's, if it's too hot, you spray the color on it, it'll just bubble right off. If it's too cold, the color won't stick. Once it's done, it looks like all the, uh, all the art that we have in here, and it's, it's ready to be in someone's home. And with that, the tedious process is finally complete. Thanks to the new foundry and showroom, local residents and visitors can see a little ancient history being recreated. And maybe even take home a piece. In our next segment, we visit with a group who believes in equal justice for all. Stay tuned for a peek inside their annual awards for our local legal heroes. Welcome to the sixth annual Heroes for Justice Awards ceremony. Thank you so much for being here tonight. This event is by far one of the most important ones hosted by Legal Aid Foundation. We honor those in our community who are truly committed to the principle of equal access to justice for all. And this evening, we are all gathered here to acknowledge their commitment. In 2007, Legal Aid inaugurated these awards to honor the late Richard Goldman. Dean Goldman was a man who made it his life's work to help others and he left an inspirational legacy of public service for all of us to follow. Thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to be before you here uh, this evening on behalf of Senator Jackson. She appreciates the work that you do. Uh, and and that, the, the small caveat on the end of that is we realize that government doesn't know all the answers, but this room very well may. So uh, thank you. Keep up the great work. And uh, we'll see you soon. There is hardly a, an organization, a nonprofit in this town that has not benefited directly from the extraordinary generosity of this person who came from England yet to our shores 
thank heavens, to bring her marvelous philanthropy to our community. So it gives me great pleasure to present to you the Baroness Lainey Feblon. I'm very grateful and very honored to accept this honor tonight. Thank you all. It is my honor to present the award to the Fund for Santa Barbara. It's my honor to give it. And the idea was simply this, that if you entrust people to know their own lives, their own situations, their own challenges best, and simply open the doors and, and provide resources and stand beside and behind them, uh, that you can get the best, most just, most true uh, solutions to some of the world's most pressing problems. And that we in Santa Barbara County uh, are, are just as susceptible to all those same challenges uh, as anywhere else in this country or this world. Ladies and gentlemen, Judge Tom Adams. But I've been on the bench for almost exactly half of my life. It's hard to believe. And it has been such an incredible blessing. I have gotten to meet with and rub shoulders with some of the really great people in the world. I am so honored to be given this wonderful, prestigious award named after a beloved friend of mine. He and I were just talking in chambers not long before we lost him. I love this man, a true hero of justice, Rich Goldman. He never said no. He never even said maybe. He always said yes. Yes to helping our mentally disabled clients improve the quality of their lives and save their precious housing. On behalf of Legal Aid Foundation of Santa Barbara County and the many, many clients he saved from homelessness, we cannot thank Dr. Bill Elliott enough. Truly, he is a hero for justice. You guys at Legal Aid are the real heroes. Oh, you go out and do so many beautiful things for people. I've brought people to you for years. I like your storefront. <laughs> Nobody walks up there being afraid to go in there. They open the door, I'm usually with them because they're scared. And somebody, a young and beautiful receptionist says, can we be of help? And there we go. There's one thing in my, di in my biography that's wrong. They talk about my wife and me enjoying our garden. Oh God, that garden drives me crazy. <laughs> Thank you again very, very much. Well, we all knew you would do it. You are kicking cancer's ass. You are a true hero of justice. And it gives me great pride, honor, and joy to present you with the 2013 Richard Goldman Hero of Justice Award. And there's no better feeling than helping a young student stay in school and succeed, or a thank you and a hug from a client, even though you didn't win, but just because you listened and gave them a voice. As lawyers, we don't really know what the meaning of not having a voice is, because most of us just can't quiet our voice. Everybody in this room either is a lawyer, is married to a lawyer, knows a lawyer, or has a lawyer. And what we need to do is to go out to all of those lawyers and all of those lawyers' lawyers and their friends and their partners and get all the lawyers in town in the large firms and the small firms to contribute in some fashion to legal aid. Legal aid is, after all, what the lawyers and the legal profession is supposed to do. Thank you all for coming. It's not often that we're encouraged to play in the street, but at one local event, that's what hundreds of visitors were encouraged to do. Check out the history behind it up next. Cabrillo Boulevard is one of Santa Barbara's busiest streets. It can be congested with traffic and not the most inviting for pedestrians. But what if you could... Ride a bike in the street, SB Open Streets. Go skate in the street, SB Open Streets. People from all around come to Santa Barbara to experience this waterfront. This is beautiful, and yet we have all these cars and a parking situation. We eliminate that component and we basically extend the beach all the way to the hotels and the businesses along this strip. Although this concept is new to Santa Barbara, 
Its inspiration has a long history, dating back to 1976. In Bogota, Colombia, approximately 30 years ago, they started this initiative but it became such a phenomenon that now they close down 70 miles of street every Sunday. And so this has stemmed from that. Each community does it their own way. And it's called the Open Streets Movement. These events really are taking off all across the countries. This will be the first time that we actually close down a stretch of roadway for people to just use the street however they want. Play a game in the street, SP Open Streets. Come skip in the street, SP Open Streets. But how do you go about closing down three miles of one of Santa Barbara's most popular thoroughfares? For SB Open Streets, the key has been collaboration. And a team of volunteers as well as kind of community partners have been working towards creating all the structural processes and the sponsorships to make this event at this caliber happen. Coast is the presenting organization. It's a big job. This big job to make SB Open Streets a reality took an incredible amount of community effort. But for the organizations involved, the benefits to both personal health and environmental health are well worth it. The power of these events is that it introduces people to bicycling and walking where they might not have ever done it before. We want to promote walking and biking and just show people how much fun it can be. People absolutely need to be outdoors and active and um, I think this is a way for people to go out and see what's possible and start trying new habits. It's helping people with their fitness but also Reducing our carbon footprint. It's all about clean air, fresh air, celebrating car-free transportation, and, and appreciating that the street can be a place where you can, you can play and you can learn about cycling and, and walking and pogo sticking and all the various things that you can do in a street without a car. Do yoga in the street, SB Open Streets. Move your body in the street, SB Open Streets. Jump rope in the street, SB Open Streets. Although the event focuses on getting people outdoors and active while lessening the impact on the environment, the greater goal is to strengthen Santa Barbara's sense of community. Santa Barbara Open Streets is all about community. And it brings different, uh, different people that normally don't work together on projects. The physical fitness community has not been linked into the alternative transportation community. And with this event, we're seeing this great synergistic partnership between the two. Um, the arts community, the music community, also bringing them in. It really lends itself to kind of the best kind of community event where you don't have to pay any money. You don't have to really register for anything. All you have to do is come out. It's open to everyone. It's, it's open to people of all ages and all incomes. It's all free. It builds that social bond that ties a community. And those types of things create a stronger community. With the incredible positive feedback and effects that Open Street events have had on other communities all over the world, there is absolutely no reason not to come out to Cabrillo Boulevard on November 2nd to enjoy the Open Street. You and me in the street, SB Open Streets. Please come, experience it for yourself, bring your friends, bring your family, bring your fun things to do, and let's enjoy the street together. Recently, TV Santa Barbara attended an event put on by the Orfala Foundation discussing the school food movement and its impacts here locally. Couldn't attend? Don't worry. Up next, we've got the highlights. Food sovereignty is what really puts the fire in my belly for the work that I do in school food reform. School food reform is an opportunity to level the playing field so that no matter what a child's family's economic status, that they have access to fresh, healthy, and appealing food choices at school. Our tagline for Food Sovereignty Week, who decides what you eat, really gets to the heart of the matter. If you start to unpack that question, you confront many more questions. Some of those questions are, who decides what food crops are planted? What breeds of livestock do we raise? Who gets to farm? Which land is farmed or grazed? Do corporations decide these issues? And one thing I will have to say is that if you don't know how to cook, a corporation will play a big role in deciding what you choose to eat for dinner. Many of you already know the statistic from the Center for Disease Control and Prevention 
that children born after the year 2000 will have a shorter life expectancy than that of their parents due to diet-related preventable disease. There's one word in there that gives me hope, preventable. That means that we can do something about that. We can begin, I think, by taking collective responsibility for our food system. Food sovereignty really spans the spectrum from the personal to the political. If you choose to act, you can insert yourself anywhere along that continuum from cooking more at home, gardening, raising your own food, or getting involved in advocacy for political issues that support an equitable food system. I have to say, I mean, I work in this field and still I was a little startled. 47 million people on SNAP, okay, Supplemental Nutrition Associ uh, Assistance Program, formerly known as food stamps and known locally as CalFresh. 32 million school children eat a school lunch each day, two thirds of them at a free or reduced price. 12 million eat a school breakfast. Half of the infants in the United States are enrolled in the WIC program, the Women, Infants, and Children's program. Another 3.5 million people are served by the Child and Adult Care Food Program. These are the big five of the USDA food assistance programs, but no, by no means the whole list. There are actually 15 separate programs with an aggregate budget of a, above 100 million, and one in four Americans participates in at least one of these programs. In addition to the federal programs, there are state programs, municipal programs, and then private charitable programs. Um, I think there are about 61,000 pantries, soup kitchens, and shelters that are affiliated with the Feeding America Network. Um, although, Eric, I may have seen 65,000 on your blog the other day. Um, it's an enormous network um, that supplements the, the federal programs, although it's part of my job, and I was speaking with some folks before this, numbers are not my, my forte, but one number I do try to keep um, tabs on is the relative size of the private, charitable, and the public food assistance effort. And Bread for the World has recently calculated that the private, the 61,000 soup kitchens and food pantries, are basically providing one meal out of 24 or one grocery bag out of 24 and the other 23 are provided through public programs. So while the charitable programs are highly visible, I think we need to, to keep in mind that many, many, many people's dinner um, depends on the public programs and therefore on politics. The anti-hunger movement is in no way unaware of the limitations of food assistance. They are the primary generators of a critique. Um, and the critique is basically, um, has to do with inadequacies of the amount of assistance. How many of you have heard that food stamps run out in the second or third week of the month? Okay, any food banker or food pantry volunteer knows that people come into the food pantry saying, my food stamps are gone. Well, this is not because poor people are lousy budgeters. This is in the design of the program. The program was designed to make sure that low-income families would contribute 30% of their disposable income toward the purchase of food. So the food stamp benefit is based on something called the Thrifty Food Plan, which is a very low-cost food plan. And what the federal government does, or what the, the relief administrator does, is calculate the cost of the Thrifty Food Plan for your household size, and then reduce it by 30% of your disposable income, which is your income after the allowable deductions. Well, the rest of us are not spending 30% of our income on food. There was a study in the mid-1950s that showed that the typical American household spent about a third of income on food. Those days are long gone. We, the rest of us, are spending about 11% of our income on food. But poor people are still expected, under the terms of this program, to spend 30%. They don't have it, especially if they're in Santa Barbara County and paying local housing uh, rates. Well, that does it for this episode of South Coast Spotlight, but be sure to join us next time for a look at the arts, culture, and community that make up the South Coast. If you have an idea for a segment, email us at info at Thanks for watching, and until next time, get out and enjoy your South Coast.